we've all got questions. Why am I here? What's the point? What difference does my life make? Thank you. Why do things that are so bad for us taste so good? Hey, hey Siri, Siri, do you, you pray? pray? I don't have an answer for that. How can I live life to the full? What can I really trust? What's my purpose? What do you think happens when you die? You're going straight to the gulags. Does anyone hear my prayer? What's for dinner? What will make me happy? Why don't good things last forever? What is God really like? Has anyone else even asked themselves these questions? Hey everyone, I've got an amazing Alpha Online group here. A better place to ask life's big questions. Ask it Alpha. Hello everybody from the Surplus family. My name's Stephen. I'm Jessica. I'm Zach. And I'm Bronwyn. And we're getting used to the lockdown. For me, that's meant working from home and getting used to doing all my meetings on Teams meetings, which I'm otherwise useless at and knew nothing about, but I've had to learn. And for Bronwyn and the kids, that's meant homeschooling. Yes, I'm feeling like a bit of a teacher at the moment. Uh, homeschooling is taking up a big portion of my day, um, but we're also managing to get out on family walks, certainly at the weekends and sometimes during the week as well with our Golden Retriever Cooper. So that's great fun. Yeah, it's given me a lot more time to play with Cooper. And I've had more time playing the trampoline, but I'm missing my friends. Yeah, I think it's true to say that we're all missing seeing people in the flesh, um, being able to have cups of coffees and catch ups with everybody. But look, we just hope you're all well. We're doing fine. And we really, really hope and pray that we'll see you all soon. Bye see you bye. Soon. Bye. bye. Hiya, um, Philtron here. You may remember me from such things like Cat Fresh Start, helping out at Extra Life, and badly miming in the worship group on Sunday mornings. Um, just wanted to say hi. Um, hope everyone's keeping safe. Um, missing being able to see everyone and, and seeing actual people. Um, but I've really enjoyed the videos that people have been putting up before services on Sunday morning. So I thought I would do one myself. So hope everyone's staying safe and um, hopefully see you all soon. Hi, it's Alice. Um, I'm just saying hi from England. Um, I'm staying with my mum at the moment. Hello, I'm Diana, Alice's mum. So nice to have her home. <laughs> and then this is the dog, Alfie. I'm just saying hi. I hope you're all well, missing you all. We're out on the prom today, having a nice walk by the sea. As you can see, it's beautiful. Just enjoying the nice weather. Stay safe, hope to see you soon. Hello. Dave Savage here. Isn't the weather been fantastic over the last number of weeks? And it's been great getting out for my daily walk. I've suddenly discovered places in around my home here in Lisburn that I've never been to before. Beautiful. I'm not meeting too many people on the way. But I do miss company. I miss my family who can't come and see me and we can only watch them on the computer. Ultimately, miss the, the company of people generally. I really would love to have a cup of tea with the boys down at the church. And most of all, my hair. I need it cut badly. But we'll have to wait. Hi everyone, Mary here. Um, just wanted to say that um, it's lovely to be able to speak to you all. I am well, thank God. I have good neighbours, good family around me. But I do miss the embrace of my children and my grandchildren. But I am embracing technology, which is wonderful. With the help of my daughter at the other end of the phone, uh, the house phone, that I am um, able to take my Sunday services, which listening to James is wonderful. I Tuesday evenings when we're all together for prayer and our house group. So. I am missing you all to be able to speak to you face to face, but God willing, we will be all together soon when this is over. So I just ask and pray that you will all keep well, keep safe, and God bless you all. Yeah, I know you 
thinking You're the only one I see you hiding out cause of what you've done And all your shame got you on the run I've been there too and it just ain't fun This is a message to the saints The table has been set, so take your place There is no more condemnation, there is only grace We are family here Colors and stains disappear There is no doubt you belong This is the family of God No matter who you are when you walk through the door Here you are no orphan anymore Brothers and sisters by blood This is the family of God oh, We are sons and daughters of the King We are, we are the royal family Hey Drifter, you can come on home You're no stranger, yeah, you are known Heavy burden world for this is our father's world This is a message to the saints The table has been set, so take your place There is no more condemnation There is only grace So, child of God Your adoption, it is done Oh, this family is forever And we've just begun
Hey, you're welcome to Lou Live on Sunday the 23rd of August. It's great to be here, great to have you with us. I, I think we need to worship God. I don't know what week you've had. Uh, there, there hasn't been great weather-wise and there are lots of other things in the media, but listen, we're here to meet with the Lord. So can we worship him? I'm gonna ask Josh to lead us in a song. All my life you have been so, so good. 
Hi boys and girls, um, I'm in the hub today and uh, it's great to be back here but I'm on my own and uh, normally you would come in here and we'd have juice and biscuits and chocolates and things down in the end but today I've just got my lonely bottle of orange and I've got my little glass as well. I want to tell you a story today from the Bible and the competition is for, for you to guess who we're talking about, all right? So I'm going to try and give you an illustration of who we might be talking about. It's a character in the New Testament. It's someone who meets Jesus. So anyway, this man, uh, a man, he wasn't very tall to so listen to the cues. He wasn't very tall. His job was to gather taxes. So let's, for example, imagine he had to collect taxes on juice, on oranges. Now, if you see, there's a red mark here. Now that is, let's say that is where he's meant to gather uh, the juice to, you know. So for each family, he's meant to take that amount of juice. But the man thinks to himself, oh, I am collecting taxes for the king and I would like a little bit more for myself. So what if he turns it around and there's a second mark? And so what he does is instead of using the first mark, which is the right one, he cheats and he puts a second mark on and he takes some more juice. Oh boy. And, and all the people know that he's, he's ripping them off. All the people know that he's stealing from them. Um, but he does it anyway. Now this little man uh, then hears that Jesus is coming to town. And if there's one thing that he knows about himself, it's this. The, the wee man knows that nobody likes him. Can you guess why nobody likes him? Well, you've probably guessed it. Because the wee man steals from all the people. He's meant to collect taxes but he steals more than he's meant to from them. So hey, one day Jesus comes to their town and the wee man is curious. He thinks, you know, maybe I'll go and have a look and see what Jesus is like. But no one, when he turns up, no one is too small and no one will let him in to see Jesus. So he thinks there's a tree. So he climbs the tree, goes up to have a look at Jesus. He's not gonna talk to Jesus. He just wants to have a look at Jesus. And he goes up the tree and he's up there. And all of a sudden, would you believe it? Jesus stops and looks up and says, the man's name, come down. I'm going to have tea at your house. And the wee man thinks, nice, but sure nobody likes me. I, I steal from them. They know it, I know it, and I don't mind it because I've got a holiday home in Caesarea Philippi and it doesn't pay for itself. They know it, I know it, nobody likes me. But Jesus wants to come to my house and to have food with me. So one of the great ways you can make friends is to actually go and have food with each other, you know, and it's a great way to build friendship. And so the wee man uh, invites Jesus into the house because Jesus is asked to come in uh, and Jesus makes friends with this little man and he forgives him his sins and he becomes his best friend. And the wee man's life is totally changed. And he realizes, you know, all these years, all these years people haven't liked me and I didn't mind because I was robbing them. And now I realize how wrong I was, all the mistakes I was making. So I'm gonna do something about it. Everybody, can I have your attention, please? Speaks to everybody, because a lot of people come in and say, I have done a lot of wrong things. Jesus has forgiven me. He's become my best friend. And because of that, I'm gonna make it up to you. So guess what he did? Bible says, if I may just illustrate, using orange juice, Bible said he filled up four times as much as what he stole and he gave it back to each person. Now that was someone who knew that he was forgiven and he also had to make it up to the people that he had robbed from. I find that story amazing. Now here's the competition boys and girls. I want you to work out who this person is and because it's a wonderful story. Jesus forgives us all of our wrongs, not just we simple things like you know, um, maybe uh, you don't clean your room or do something silly. Like the big things, like this man was a thief. This man robbed people. This man broke the law. But God was willing to forgive him. Jesus was willing to forgive him. And Jesus is willing to forgive us all of our sins and become our friends too. If we welcome him into our lives, just like this man did, and become friends with him. And I hope you will do that. I hope you know that Jesus loves you and will forgive you anything you do wrong if you ask him to forgive you, and he will. Now, that's the promise. That's why this story is important. It tells us a promise from God. Now, can you guess who this person is? Now, it wasn't orange juice that he took from the people. It was money. You will find the story in Luke chapter 19. 
small man climbs a big tree to see Jesus. Who might that be? Well, if you can work that out and draw a picture of this person, and maybe the tree, or maybe going to Jesus' house, I don't mind, draw a picture of the story and write along the bottom the name of this man and send in your competition the best, the best picture. Guess what you're gonna get this week? I'm gonna buy you 12, did I say 12? I said 12, 12 tins of your favorite drink. Couldn't say better than that. So enjoy your competition. Luke chapter 19, remember Luke 19, you will find the story of this man. And remember, remember what Jesus did for him. Forgave him all the wrongs that he did and became his friend. Thanks for listening, boys and girls. I hope you have a great week. Well, boys and girls, I hope you really will enjoy that competition. You can go off now and investigate, find out uh, in Luke chapter 19 who we're talking about and get those great pieces of art uh, on their way. But can we, before you go off, can we pray together and let's invite uh, the Lord Jesus just to watch over us and to look after us. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for all of our boys and girls and parents and guardians and everyone who's watching today. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless and look after all of the boys and girls we pray, Lord, that we might know that you are our friend, that, Lord, you always see us, however big or small we might be, that you never miss us in a crowd, and that you care for us and you love us very, very deeply. Be with the boys and girls, Lord. We pray for them as they get ready for school after so many months away. And we pray and ask that, Lord, for the rest of the, the time that we have off, that, Lord, it will be a really special time. Be with the children now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 this morning, if you'd like to follow with me, from verse 1. This is part of our Finding a Faith That Climbs series. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Well, can we invite the Lord to come, the Holy Spirit, to come and speak to our hearts. Let us pray together. Holy Spirit, we welcome you, Lord, and we invite you to come and speak to our hearts. Maybe we're here today and we're searching for answers. We pray, Lord, that you will come and speak and give us those answers. Perhaps we are Christians, maybe we are followers of Jesus. And Lord, we, we need to be encouraged and reassured in these most uncertain times that you are with us and you are for us. So come, Holy Spirit, speak to us through your mighty word. In Jesus' name, amen. So there was this beautiful car. It was 250,000 pounds worth, at least that's what you would pay for a new one. And it was parked illegally on a street in a provincial town in Northern Ireland. It had a parking ticket in its windscreen because it was illegally parked. It was too close to the entrance uh, to a cafe car park. The reason why I know all of this is because I crashed into it. Yes, I crashed into the 250,000 pound car. I was having a coffee with someone I needed to meet and I came out, I jumped into my seven-year-old Volvo and I went through the, the gateway uh, to, and, uh, which met the road and uh, I turned left and as I turned left there was a <laughs> crunching noise, pedestrians stopped, cars stopped, the whole town seemed to stop. He's just hit a £250,000 car with that old Volvo of his. So anyway, I drove up, I, I stopped the car, hit the hazards, jumped out of the car, and as I was moving my way back uh, to see the damage, this lovely young mom and two kids ran towards me. It's okay, it's okay. You've just scuffed the bumper. There's not even a dent. 
And I thought, whew, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you very much. And then I went over and I inspected the car. And sure enough, there was a circle of paint missing uh, on a pla- from a plastic bumper. Not so much as a dent. Anyway, it was bad enough. So I uh, went and looked for the owner of the, the car. I went into the cafe. He wasn't there. Waited for a while. The person wasn't there. So then I wrote a note. I, and I apologized for scuffing uh, the bumper, left my name and telephone number and asked them to please phone me. So I put that beside the illegal parking ticket uh, in the windscreen wiper and then I had to go on. So a day passed, two days passed, a week passed, two weeks have passed, no phone call. And I'm thinking, phew, I'm, I'm kind of relieved. I'm kind of relieved that they've just left it alone. Now to be fair to me, my car has a dent stretching right across two to three panels up one side of the vehicle. Uh, So I'm going to have to pay a fair wee bit of money to get that fixed. But I want you to imagine that you owned that £250,000 car. You've just gone for a nice lunch. I don't know, maybe uh, you've gone and met your wife or something like that and you're having a lunch and now you've got to go back to work and you come out and what's this, a parking ticket and a scrap of paper and the bumper's been bumped (laughs) and this is an expensive car. How would you feel? How would you react? Or put yourself in my shoes. Would you have been worried over these last number of days and, and weeks? Well, well, I wasn't worried because I am insured by Tesco's and I was pretty confident that they would cover me comprehensively. But what I want to think about today is character because it's only when things happen to us that our character is really tested. And there's one word I'd like to share with you this morning that really encapsulates Christian character. And that word is resolve. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and we'll we'll see what Paul says because he is resolved. For I resolved, Paul says, to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I resolved. Now in ancient Greek, um, what that word means really is to reach or come to a conclusion. The way you might come to a conclusion in the sense of, ah, now I see what I'm meant to do. Now I understand this. Now I know where I'm meant to go in life. It's kind of like a moment of clarity. Paul has reached this conclusion, like a moment of clarity, that Jesus Christ is the answer to his life. The person who he's been searching for all these years. He's the answer to his problems. He's the answer to the world's dilemmas and problems and all of the people therein. Paul has come to this amazing conclusion that Jesus is the answer to his life and the lives of everyone on this planet. And so he resolves. He resolves to build his life on this conclusion and to go and tell other people of the answer that he's found. I wonder if you're here listening online today and you're searching for answers and you've been reading all kinds of books. You know, there's essential guides to happiness at 9.99 or how to understand the world or how how to uh, have a fulfilled life. One of those. Maybe you've been reading a a bunch of those. Maybe you've been trying all kinds of ideas, but you still haven't found that answer. Well, I, like Paul, would warmly commend to you Jesus Christ. He is the answer that you're looking for. And I would encourage you now to put your faith and trust in Jesus, to to go and explore Jesus and, and talk to him and invite him into your life. He is the answer we're all looking for. He's the answer we all need. Or supposing you're listening in today and you you have come to that conclusion like Paul and and you realize that Jesus is the answer. Well, how are you building your life on that conclusion? And and what about your resolve? Another definition in English uh, for resolve is to be determined. How determined are you to build your life on Jesus Christ and him alone? I want to share with you a couple of things that will help us all with our resolve, which is an important part of character. You won't climb out of the troughs. We won't get through this pandemic unless we have a certain level of resolve. So how is your resolve? Here are a couple of things that can help us all with our resolve. The first thing is this. Whatever happens to you, keep on believing. Such an important principle. When we get into the context of of Corinth, and this letter that Paul has written to the small church in Corinth, we we come to learn that the people in Corinth uh, love a little bit of knowledge. You ever heard that phrase, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing? They have a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of knowledge of philosophy, but not the full knowledge. And that little bit of philosophy goes to their heads, makes them quite arrogant and proud. The whole series of the Simpsons cartoons is based on the premise that Homer Simpson has a little bit of knowledge, and that's a very dangerous thing. 
And in Corinth, uh, these Christians have a little bit of knowledge and it's taking them away from Jesus and it's taking them away from each other. And now I want you to hear what Paul says. Now, Paul is a man who is a scholar. He, he was a man who had read the philosophy, a man who went to the best college or university, had the best teacher, professor. He was a genius of a man. Uh, I've heard people today describe Paul in the terms of a genius. And yet when Paul goes to this Corinthian church, he doesn't try to run rings around them philosophically. He doesn't try to uh, make them look foolish. In fact, this is what he says in verse 4 of our reading. My message and my preaching were not, not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. He says, I didn't come to you uh, with all of my intellectual knowledge. I came with you resolved to know nothing, not to use any other knowledge, but Jesus Christ. Their little bit of knowledge and their puffed up pride, <clears throat> knowledge puffs up, loves, builds up. Their little bit of knowledge and puffed up pride was taking them away from Jesus. They thought they were too cool for the cross. But it's not only intellectually, we can also uh, have problems in terms of uh, a little bit of knowledge in other aspects of life. Whenever things go wrong, for example, we'll see some of the things that went wrong in Paul's life later in the talk. But <clears throat> when things go wrong, uh, it's very easy to come to all kinds of cl conclusions on the basis of a little bit of knowledge. Peter one night uh, was out in the water with Jesus and he saw the waves, that was his little bit of knowledge, and he started to sink through water and into doubt. Elijah was a great preacher, a man of God in the Old Testament. God had done amazing things through him. And then one day, an off-the-cuff remark from Jezebel, the queen, and his heart melts in fear like a candle, and he gives up for a while. Sometimes we can have a little bit of knowledge of our circumstance without really knowing the full picture of what's ahead. And that little bit of knowledge without knowing the full picture is enough to make us break our resolve. Do you know what I think resolve is? I think resolve is whenever you experience things in life, it can be an accident, it can be anything at all really, and you have a little bit of knowledge of that circumstance, but you know you, you don't know the full picture of, of your current circumstance or the future. A resilient faith, a resolved faith, is one that trusts Jesus for the bit of the story and often the largest part of the story that we cannot see or understand. This was brought home to me recently. I, I, I love films, as if you know me. You know I'm a film buff. Um, but I, I watched this Christian film recently and sometimes uh, you know, the production of a Christian film won't be that sophisticated or that good. But this was superb. Uh, it's about a, a young woman called Bethany Hamilton. Uh, the film is called Soul Surfer. It tells the story of Bethany, who was a young professional surfer. She just started out in her career. And one day, one early morning, she went out surfing and she's uh, on the board with her friends uh, waiting to catch a wave when a great, unpredictably, a great tiger shark came and severed off her arm just here. Well, they got her ashore and boy, did they have to work to save her life. Everyone around her, her mum, her dad, her brothers, sisters, everyone in the family, they, they were all uh, filled with sorrow and, and felt sorry for Bethany. And, and it really disturbed everyone in that town. The only person who didn't feel sorry for Bethany was Bethany. Incredibly so. Within one month of that bite, she was back on the water surfing again in competition. Within two months of that accident at sea, and um, she joined her church team. She's a Christian. She joined a church team that went to help bring relief to, remember the Boxing Day tsunami, the terrible tsunami? She went uh, two months after her ex accident to help children in Thailand uh, and other people suffer, who suffered through the tsunami. In one scene, these little kids who have lost everything uh, are petrified of the water. And what Bethany does is she finds this old surfboard and she takes it in her, her one arm now and she, she gets onto the water and she encourages the children to come 
onto the water with her and she teaches them how to surf. It's an incredible story. When she wins America's Sports Personality of the Year, she stands up on the stage and she says pretty much what Paul says. She testifies to Jesus Christ, resolved to know Jesus Christ. Sometimes to be resolved to know nothing but Jesus Christ means that you, you have to push all the other competing voices and thoughts out of your mind. All the naysayers, all the critics, all those who would say you can't achieve. And just resolve to know Jesus Christ. Which is what she did. One year later, she was world champion. Uh, it's an incredible film. I commend it to you. You should watch it. It's brilliant. I loved it. I found it very moving. If we're going to keep our resolve, we've got to keep believing. Uh, no matter what happens. Uh, whether they're natural disasters, whether they're accidents in life, whatever befalls us, a pandemic, we've got to keep believing. But the second thing I want to share with you briefly this morning to help us all keep our resolve to build our lives on this wonderful conclusion that Jesus is the answer to our lives and our problems and to the world's problems and the people in it. The second thing is this. We've got to keep on concluding. Keep concluding that Jesus is the answer. And uh, one of the things that Paul says uh, in his letter to the Corinthians is in this verse that I've been sharing, verse 2. For I resolved to do nothing while I was with you, except, now I want you to look at that second part of the sentence, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And what Paul is doing in this letter is he's drawing them back to the cross because they've drifted from the cross. He's drawing them back to the center of Christianity. And the center of Christianity is this, that God paid the price for our sins on the cross, that we could be totally forgiven. And it's by constantly coming back to the cross, coming back to the God of love and forgiveness, that we will keep on concluding that Jesus is the conclusion we want to build our lives on, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you a story. It's a story from uh, the gospels themselves. It's a story about Jesus in Luke chapter 7. I'm going to put up a few headers just to, to keep you uh, informed of what's happening in this story as we go along. So the first thing I want to, want to put up on the screen is forgiveness is, lo is love. Forgiveness is love. Now here's the story. So Jesus goes to a party organized by a wealthy but highly conservative Pharisee of a little town. And everyone in the village is invited to this party and uh, you can imagine the place is full. They're quite conservative. Some people are sitting there with a scowl on the whole time. Uh, no matter what Jesus will say, they will not listen to a word that comes from his mouth. It's that kind of very judgmental religious atmosphere. But other time folk have come in. One person who comes in is this woman. Oh, and she is glamorously dressed. Um, she is high end. She is a wealthy woman. But if there had been the Sun, Palestine, the Palestinian, the Sun maggot newspaper, she might have featured on that tabloid on, on the front cover because she'd made some mistakes in her life. Everyone in the room knew her, and they all knew about the mistakes. And she comes in to this party. She stands backward in the shadows, and Jesus is at the center, and the religious people are around him, and she's listening from the shadows. And, and something happens to her. When Jesus starts to speak, when Jesus looks at her, for the first time in her life, she realizes that God loves her no matter what she's done. And in the person of Jesus, she sees her Savior. She knows he's willing to forgive her every mistake she's ever committed. Do you know something about forgiveness? Forgiveness reminds me of rulers or the metric system. The measure of our forgiveness represents the measure of our love. And so in this moment, her heart melts because when she looks at Jesus and Jesus looks at her and she hears what he's saying about forgiveness... She realizes that the measure of Jesus' forgiveness extends and covers every mistake this woman has ever made. And by the measure of Jesus' forgiveness, she now realizes the breadth of his love for her. It's a moment of great clarity. It's the moment when she reaches that conclusion that Jesus is the answer she's been looking for all of these years. 
I wonder, have you reached that conclusion yourself? It's important that we know how much God loves us and how much he's willing to forgive us. Now, out of this conclusion, the really exciting thing that comes next is that she wants to do something for Jesus. It's kind of like, you know, Jesus has touched her life. She knows she's forgiven. She's, she knows she's loved by God. And now she thinks to herself, I want to express what's in me outwardly. I want to express the gratitude I feel, the joy, the, the remorse, the, the celebration of what God has done in my life. So what can I do for Jesus? And she notices something. She notices that when Jesus came into this party, there was a great cultural mistake made. Now, culturally, you're meant to have water to wash the feet of everyone who comes in. Usually a servant, a, a waiter would look after the feet of everyone because it was dusty and that was etiquette. They let Jesus come into this party, held in his honor, and they don't wash his feet. They show him great dishonor. And so she looks over and she realizes no one's washed his feet. Got this perfume. So from the shadows, she walks into the center of the room. She undoes the, the bottle. She starts to wash his feet. I am sure everyone in the room stopped what they're saying and, and looked in utter astonishment. She, she washes his feet and the tears are flowing, tears of remorse, tears of joy, tears of celebration. And, and uh, the, the perfume spilling and she's long hair and she perhaps starts to clean up a bit of the mess. She just uses her hair. Her hair is bowed. Uh, she's in a moment of great, great clarity about her life, about who God is and what Jesus has come to do for her. And she's oblivious to anyone else in the room. She's come to do something for Jesus. Out of this act, we come then to wrong and right conclusions. The wrong conclusion is there are these people sitting around the room, they're watching this woman, uh, and they start a conversation about her while she's still in the room. And they say terrible things about her. They say things like, Jesus, do you know who's touching you? Do you know where she's been? It's as if she's not even a human being. That's the wrong conclusion. The right conclusion is what Jesus says in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, verse 44. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. As they judge this woman and have all kinds of conversations, she's still in the room. The first thing Jesus does is point out some of their wrongs. You know, I came into this house, I meant to be the guest, and you insulted me. She's doing for me what you were meant to do. I read this great quote uh, by Theodore Roosevelt. You know, it's a terrible thing, very discouraging, when people who are doing nothing for Jesus turn and criticize those who are doing wonderful things for Jesus. And uh, it's a great lesson for us. Um, this is what Theodore Roosevelt said in the, on the 23rd of April, 1910. It is not the critic who counts, not the person who points out how the strong person stumbles or where the doer of deeds does not, do, uh, could have done better. The credit belongs to the person who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who actually strives to do the deeds who knows great enthusiasm, the great devotions, who spends themselves in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he or she fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that their place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Theodore Roosevelt I couldn't have put it better myself. What an amazing quote. People in the room are sitting there criticizing, criticizing this woman for doing something for Jesus that they were not prepared to do for Jesus. What an amazing moment. A moment of learning for all of us. Out of this conclusion, this moment of clarity in her life, she feels that she must do something for Jesus. And I, I have to be honest, that, 
That's the reason why anyone wants to serve Jesus. Out of a moment of clarity like this. But then Jesus says something else in verse 47. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Whoever, lo whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. This is the real challenge to all of us. If we lose sight of God's forgiveness of our sins, if we lose sight of the fact that when Jesus died on the cross, he was willing to forgive the sins of every person who's ever lived, should they come and ask him for forgiveness, then, then we, we miss the whole point. We, we, we will not keep concluding that Jesus is the answer because the answer is his forgiveness. If you see what I mean. Once we stop looking to the cross, we will start to no longer conclude that he is the answer to my life and to that person's life and to every person's life. One of the greatest problems we can have in terms of our resolve is whenever we have unforgiveness in our hearts or bitterness or resentment or jealousy or any of these things. Because at that moment, our, our resolve starts to break and our concluding that Jesus is the answer starts to melt. I mean, how can you, if you think of it logically, how can any of us believe and conclude that Jesus is the answer to my life, the answer to my problems, and the answer to everyone's lives and problems? How can we believe this if at the same time we're not prepared to forgive someone? This doesn't make any sense. Because God, the message of Jesus, is all about forgiveness. It's all about salvation, open to every person and any person who's alive today. I wonder today, could your resolve, could your resolve be broken, waning, weakening, because you're not keeping concluding that Jesus is the answer that we all need. The only way we will keep on concluding that he is the answer is by keep on looking at the cross. Keep on seeing in Jesus the answer, the love, the forgiveness, the, the extent of his love, which teaches us the breadth of his love, the extent of his forgiveness, which teaches us the breadth of his love. Only by looking at the cross. We've got to keep on concluding that Jesus is the answer to every person's need alive. And the way we do that is by looking at the cross. Let me wrap this up today. I want to read from uh, 2 Corinthians verse 11. And I think Paul is the great illustration of, of this whole teaching today. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul recounts everything that's happened to him. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And what I love about Paul is that no matter what happens to him, he keeps his resolve. You know, accidents, nature has dealt me some pretty tough things, shipwrecked. But I'm willing to, to forgive that and move on. The Romans treated me pretty harshly, but I'm willing to forgive their injustice. Friends betrayed me, but I'm willing to forgive their injustice disloyalty. No matter what happens to him, Paul never loses sight, or loses sight of the cross. He never loses sight of the message that Jesus died for sinners, that Jesus came into the world for sinners, people who have made mistakes, in order to forgive us, in order that we might know how much he loves us, and in order to welcome us into the very kingdom of heaven itself. 
So in all of these situations, in every circumstance, Paul says in Philippians, in all circumstances, Paul knows that Jesus is there for him and Jesus is enough. And Paul resolves to know nothing in those circumstances but the message of Jesus. How is your resolve today in this pandemic? We, we have all suffered. I, I heard this week in the news, they were saying that everyone's getting tired of the pandemic. But we need to resolve whatever is happening in the world around us or in our own lives, we need to keep being resolved to know nothing but Jesus Christ, to keep this message at the center of who we are. Would you like to do that today? Do you need God's help? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the life of Paul. We thank you for this incredible message. Lord, the resolve that this man had. Lord, when, when accidents of nature happened, he, he didn't blame nature or life and he certainly didn't stop. When he suffered from authorities and governments and wrong decisions, uh, Lord, he was able to forgive those things. And whenever even close friends let him down, Paul would not nurse a grudge. He kept on forgiving. He kept on renewing that conclusion that he came to all those years ago on what is called the road to um, Damascus. He kept on renewing that conclusion because he kept on looking to you. He kept on looking to the message, the plan, God's plan for this world. Maybe today, Lord, our resolve has been weakening in this pandemic. We've been struggling. We've been reacting. We've been struggling with the restrictions. We've been struggling with the interruptions of our plans and education, uh, our jobs, our lives, our livelihoods. And Lord, we're struggling and, and we're reacting perhaps in, in the wrong way. Help us now, Lord Jesus, to forgive whatever we need to forgive, to let go of whatever we need to let go of, to forgive whoever we need to forgive, so that we may know nothing. We may know nothing of unforgiveness, nothing of bitterness, nothing of resentment. We may know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. I ask you today, Lord, to fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Pour your love into our hearts. Pour into us a generosity of spirit that we may be the most forgiving people you could ever meet. Come, Lord, we ask. We pray, Lord, for anyone who has been asking questions that, Lord, they may come to the same conclusion that Paul came to, that Jesus Christ is the answer to life, to life's problems and the world's difficulties. I pray for anyone who uh, is searching today that you may find Jesus and you can find him by faith. Just ask him to forgive you and to come into your life and to be your friend. And he will do that. Just pray for you now. Make your commitment. Come to this conclusion. Ask Jesus to help you come to this conclusion. And Lord, I finally want to pray for this pandemic, this terrible virus and the increase in numbers this week. And we pray in your name, Lord, that the number will go down again, the R number will go down, the number of new infections will drop off again, that, Father, you will keep us safe and well in these nations. And we pray, Father, uh, for healing of anyone who is ill. And we pray, Father, for an effective vaccine to be found as soon as possible. In the meantime, Lord, may you help each one of us to keep our resolve that we may know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, uh, it's been great to share with you this morning. I'm going to invite 
uh, Roger to sing, uh, Yet Not I. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven not to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and mindless peace. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine, I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend. It has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave. To this I hope my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. What does it take to live a life of adventure? The truth is, the first step 
is always the hardest. That's the one that takes the most courage. But I've learned not to run from that fear and just do it. My Christian faith can be a little up and down, like any relationship. It has struggles and it has doubts. But it's so often brought light to a dark path. Warmth to a cold mountain and strength to a failing body. I remember crawling onto the summit of Everest and clearing the snow from my mask to see the curvature of the earth at the edges. But finding a simple faith that empowers my life, to me, that's been my greatest adventure. Got questions about life? Try Alpha. Well, thank you very much uh, to Josh and Roger for leading us in praise this morning. And uh, also, I hope the children will really enjoy that competition. And, and we will get those uh, cans of Coke or Fanta or whatever it is uh, out to the winner this week. Uh, we'll, we'll get that to you. So I hope the kids will get involved. Now, tonight we have live lounge at 7 o'clock. We open at 6.45 on Zoom. If you need the Zoom connection, please email admin at low.church and we'll send you out the link. On Tuesday night, we have a prayer gathering. But coming very soon, on the 2nd of September, we are delighted to be part of a very large South Belfast Alpha course. So I hope you'll really enjoy that. Uh, you've seen the video already today, promoting the Alpha by Bear Grylls. Uh, why don't you consider it? Uh, check out the details online, on our Facebook, on the internet, and uh, register online. We'd love you to come and be part of our virtual Alpha course, which is coming very soon. And also, we have a, a little guide, a mini guide. Now, People from Finnegan will know that we as a church send out a probably about a 60 page uh, booklet every two months, uh, sorry, every, twice a year, uh, really encouraging people about our ministries, about how we can help people and so on. Well, because of the crisis, uh, we're putting out a smaller version in September, uh, which will be much shorter, but we'll give you an up-to-date uh, picture of what the church is up to and what we're, we're about. And it will just cover September and October. And then when we get to October, there'll be a second guide and so on. So look out for that guide. It's coming your way very soon. Well, listen, I hope you have a great Sunday, the rest of this day, and a great new week. And may the Lord go with you. Thanks for tuning in.